working. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our webinar today, Dissecting a Hip Risk. My name is Carlos Leyva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines Publishing, the publisher of the Hip Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. My co-panelist today is my associate at the Digital Business Law Group, John Nelson. And hello, monitoring, uh, say hello, John. Hi, everybody. And monitoring the chat questions is our director of operations, Martin Gwynn. Um, good, good afternoon. Martin, uh, don't put yourself on mute, man, because sometimes I ask you questions and then you disappear for two minutes before you come back. So um, don't do that. <laughs> I'm just warning you, man. <laughs> Um, no, Martin's got a house full of kids he has to tend to sometimes, and so he's, he's, just, he's got to tend to them. Anyway, um, here's our agenda today. We're going to cover learning objectives, background, risk assessments, but only in the context of a risk, okay? And then we're going to go over some vocab metho uh, methodology and timing. Uh, that all has to do with risk assessments. In this particular um, webinar, we're going to drill down to the specifics of a risk. Now, those of you who have been with us before, you know that we like to take questions as we go, and we like to have a conversation back and forth. So we will do Q&A at the end, but it's probably more effective for everybody if um, we take questions as we go. So OK, if you're doing a risk assessment, there's some language you got to know. You got to have a process. You need to do it, uh, we think, at least once a year. There's some people on the hook. These same people are on the hook for risk, okay? We're just doing a drill down into what is a particular risk. When we talk about risk assessments, that's kind of like a global macro thing. Now we're going to talk about risks, which is more atomic, right? That's the thing that makes up that you're trying to identify in a risk assessment, okay? And from a HIPAA perspective, the risk uh, or the liability, if you want to look at it that way, are going to come from the three rules. Privacy rule, security rule, and breach notification rule. That's that's it. That's that's the universe of where things can come from. Now, that's not all of HIPAA. Obviously, the HIPAA is a pretty big um, statute. It deals with transactions. It deals with a lot of other things. But from a privacy and security perspective, this is what we're dealing with, and this is the context of which we're going to talk about risk. Okay. And again, uh, your challenge is to make your risk story or the, your story of eliminating risk or in the, in the words of the security rule, re reducing risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, et cetera, is to get better at that over time. There's no such thing as a perfect risk assessment. It's not going to be perfect the first time for sure. It won't be perfect the hundredth time you do it. And oh, by the way, perfection is not the objection. Okay, it's not the uh, it's, it's not the objective. Excuse me, it's not the objective. The ob the objective is to continuously identify risk and reduce them to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. That's the standard uh, that you have to meet. So, if this is new to you, there's this entire sort of lingo that goes around with security, and it's really part of any subject matter domain. And you just got to get comfortable with the lingo, otherwise. You can't really speak the language. I'm not going to go through these. You guys can read them. Um, we will cover later, for our purposes, the definition of a risk. Most of these um, vocabulary items came from the NIST standards and special publications having to do with how, how you conduct a risk assessment. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it's NIST special publication 800-30. That, I mean, that's what comes to mind. John, do you know? Yeah, I believe that's the correct one. Can um, can we get a little background on exactly why everyone um, in this uh, in the compliance uh, field looks towards NIST for these issues? Um, sure. So NIST NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and sometimes I get confused and I say science and technology, but they're a, you know, they're a government organization responsible for um, informing other government agencies as to how to comply, in, you know, with 
privacy and security issues. Now, their mandate is much broader than that, right? And this is, has all kinds of standards uh, and it does all kinds of good things. But, you know, from our perspective, that's the role they play. They were also, uh, their protocols or their recommended protocols is what the HHS secretary recommended in the reach notification interim final rule way back in 2009 as it being the security protocols, these the encryption protocols that you had to comply with if you were going to take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor. Okay, so ever since then, you know, it's been NIST, NIST, NIST. And NIST has a set of special publications that are really, you know, reference documents or how do you do a risk assessment, how do you comply with the security rule. The pro they're, they're, they're good documents if you have no, no place else to go. The problem with the risk, I mean, the problem with the NIST documents, for example, how to implement the security rule is that they're a government agency. And so instead of telling you how to, they're never going to tell you how to, okay? Because then you can make the argument, well, we did it just exactly the way you told us to. How can you now say we're not in compliance? Okay, so what they do, for example, for the security rule is you can get a this special publication, I don't know what this one is, 53, 54, I forget, for implementing a security rule. And then for each requirement, what they do is they play 20 questions. They say, well, when you get to this requirement, here are the 20 or 30 questions that you ought to be asking yourself. And, you know, by that point, after the first requirement, you're, you're ready to, you know, pull your hair out because, hey, I was looking for answers, not questions. Okay, so exactly, you know, exactly. but it's as close as we can come. Yeah. Well, since they won't tell you how to do anything, is they're not going to open themselves up to that. This correct. Still, is the the gold standard. Correct. Yeah, it's the gold standard because it's the best that we can do, vis-a-vis -vis something from the government. Absolutely. Obviously, we like to think in our products and services. We educate. We teach. This is why we do monthly webinars. Our products are all about teaching or checklists go through and tell you how to comply with the, each requirement, right? So, so we do the we do the how-to stuff that NIST um, doesn't do. Now, we'll let this just stop there and see if there's any questions about NIST or the context of what we're talking about here. Not, not at this time. Okay, so it turns out that you really do have to become somewhat comfortable with these definitions or you're going to get lost in the weeds. Okay, and there's a lot of confusion between like a risk assessment and, and risk management, and both of those are implementation specifications and a security rule. They happen to be uh, the first two, okay, under the standard, under the first standard of the administrative safeguards. Okay, these are all the all four implementation specifications under that first standard are required. The first one is the risk assessment. This is where you identify risks. And the next one is risk management, which is really your entire security rule, privacy rule program. So risk management, when you look at it, kind of swallows the entirety of the rules, all of them. Okay, so not clear why HHS decided to do it this way, because under the risk management implementation specification, that's really a process implementation specification. And the first thing they say to do is do a risk assessment. Okay. And I, I believe the reason they decided to separate it like that is that to send the message that a risk assessment is not a set and forget, do one thing, do it one time, and forget about it, okay? It, it's not that kind of thing, right? And eliminating risks, or, or it's not that kind of thing. You've got to do one, you know, we, we say at a minimum once a year, but really you should be doing these once a quarter. And we'll talk about Espresso, a product we're about to ship in, uh, on August 15th that will let you do a risk assessment an amount of hours instead of weeks or months, okay? Uh, and you'll be able to get better and better at doing those risk assessments, but the, the, it, it, it's, it's a process, okay? These are processes, and I believe HHS wanted to highlight the fact that it's a process by including risk assessment as the first step in risk management, okay? And then they go on to doing the other thing. Now, the other thing, just to be clear, is that a risk assessment is an analytical step. You don't fix anything in the risk assessment. Where you do the fixing by implementing controls, which we'll talk about a little bit later, where you do the fixing is in the risk management part, right? So you have this analysis part, and then you have this fixing part, and they're two separate implementation specifications in the security rule. 
but the analysis is is the first step in execution. So they are they're distinct concepts, but for um, for our tech friends out there, you can consider the risk management to be your main function. And the first thing that it does is call the risk assessment function. So you are every time you're you're wanting to do any sort of execution to implement controls, things like that, you can't do that unless you first execute that first, that analysis step, unless you make that first function call. Right, exactly. So you're not, you're not you know, in, in just in non-technical um, you know, terms, um, it, it's just you can't do, you can't implement the controls until you've done the risk analysis or the risk assessment because you don't know where the controls need to be implemented. You know, to attach to what security objects, blah blah. All that analysis happens in the risk assessment, and also confusing. You know, various authors, and we do it too. You know what I mean? The, 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 we will say risk analysis or risk assessment, and I forget which. You know, um, HHS uses. I think they use risk analysis actually as the first implementation specification, but everybody talks about it as a risk assessment. They're the same thing. All right, for all intents and purposes. So you have that first implementation specification, then it's repeated again because your risk management program is really this infinite loop. Um, you know, assess, streamline, right? Implement, monitor, report, assess, and so on. Okay. Um, we're going to talk more about threats, vulnerabilities, and controls. So there's really no need to cover that here. Okay. So what is the objective, though, of all this stuff? And the objective ought to be fairly clear now. Is yes, you want to comply with the regulations so you're not violating the law. But you know, unless you've had your head in the sand for the last ten years, you know the bad guys are out there working 24/7, 365 to break into your network, get your PHI, sell it on the black market, and, and, and otherwise make your life miserable ransomware, hold you up for ransom, etc. right? This is, we've gone way beyond now, the, you know, just complying with uh, the law, okay? This is, this is serious stuff, especially when it comes to ransomware. And you just recently saw a fine, I think, of 620000 or 640000 of a business associate for a unencrypted laptop with a bunch of PHI. You saw a, a fine for $3.7 million. Um, and I can't remember. That was a covered entity fine. So, and, and HHS has, you know, been out there fairly aggressive. I guess it takes them about two years between the time they do their initial investigation and the time they come up with a a monetary penalty that you have to, uh, you know, pay and then comply with. So, really, what we're trying to do as a practical matter is we're trying to constrain and proof your practice. Okay, beyond all the rest of the BS, this is. IT 101. We want to make sure that if Katrina hits, your practice will still be there tomorrow. Your records will still be there. Your practice may not be there. The building may be gone, but your records won't be gone. Okay, and you can set up shop somewhere else and get started. That's ultimately the method, the the objective that we're trying to uh, get done. And you want to reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. So, John, why don't you explain to our audience what reasonable and appropriate means? <laughs> reasonable and appropriate is um, uh, weasel language uh, on on the behalf of HHS. It's um, it, it doesn't have a a concrete meaning. It's it's an objective standard, uh, similar to in law the reasonable person standard. And who is a reasonable person? They don't exist. It's a hypothetical of what is reasonable. And it's a subjective analysis that you have to go through when you're applying risks to controls, and you're analyzing the effect of that uh, of of applying that that control uh, to a risk. Does that really does that reduce it to levels that are reasonable and appropriate, or is or could we do more? Now, reasonable and appropriate doesn't mean that you have to do everything you possibly could under the sun. It just requires what the hypothetical reasonable actor would do. Right, and ultimately, that what that hypothetical actor would do is going to be determined by a court of law or by HHS. If they deem, if they find that what you did was not reasonable and appropriate, so let's just give an example, right? 
the security rule is not mandated by uh, um, encryption is not mandated by the security rule. You can comply. You can be in compliance with the security rule and not encrypt. Of course, if you don't encrypt, you don't get the safe harbor from breach notification. But those are two different things. Okay. The, it, it, in, in the security rule, the encryption is a, is an addressable implementation specification. That means you've got to look at it, implement it if you can, and if you can't, implement something that's reasonable and appropriate. Okay. And if you can't find something that's reasonable and appropriate, you better have a damn good reason and document it why you did nothing. Okay. So. The addressable implementation specifications of security rules don't doesn't really mean you can ignore them. A lot of people think, oh, they're addressable, you can just ignore them. No. No. You read you read the law, you read the regs, it says implement it the way it is. Or implement something instead of it. Or find a good reason. You better document a good reason why you're doing it. Sometimes there's good reasons. You can document it and that's fine. Okay? But it's you know, a court of law could find that because all of your peers were uh, using encryption because encryption has become so easy to use. There's really no good reason why you didn't do it. That what you did wasn't reasonable and appropriate, despite despite the fact that the security rule doesn't mandate it. Okay, a court of law. And on could the other find side, huh? And on the other side, an entire industry can be wrong. Let's say no one's encrypting because it's it's too hard for everybody. Now. Maybe a, an entire industry can be wrong about that, and a court can say, well, that it, it's still unreasonable. The fact that everyone else is, is not doing it either doesn't save you. It, it, it really depends on the specific facts, the circumstances, and what you're trying to do. But you cannot get out of the analysis. So even the fact that you did the analysis, that you looked at this addressable uh, requirement, that will help you. That will help your argument uh, if you know, things hit the fan. So ultimately, what does reasonable and appropriate mean? It, it, I'm going to quote Oliver, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who served on the Supreme Court for about 30 years. He, he, he said uh, in a famous essay, by the way, um, about the bad, the bad man's view of the law, he said that uh, the law is whatever a court says it is. <laughs> and if anybody's practiced law, you quickly understand that. That's what the law is, what, the, what a court says it is, until some other court says different. Okay, So these are the weasel words that are embedded into the security rule around all of it, actually, all of it. Okay, We talk about agile me methodology. You know, This is how we all our products uh, are agile. They're meant to educate. They're meant to get you, they're meant to get you started. Uh, and, and, and delivering something right away, okay? Because you don't even know, most people don't even know the complexity of the rules until they get started. So the most important thing you can do is get started and get educated and do something, and then you'll learn and do something else, etc. And by the way, HHS understands that. So, you know, Tom Peters, famous management guru, coined fail forward fast about 40 years ago now. And that's the concept, really. It's not really about failing. It's about doing and learning and getting better at it. Okay, that's the whole synopsis of agile. And why? Because it's the only way to attack a wicked problem. HIPAA compliance is not an engineering problem. Where if we know all the physics and the math, we're just going to do step one, step two, step three. It's not going to work that way, right? For for a lots of different reasons. But one, first of all, almost everybody doesn't understand the problem until they start solving it. Why? Because because it turns out that compliance has a lot of social complexity. Each organization is going to be different. Each organization has different budgets. Each organization may have grumpy old docs or less grumpy old docs, docs that hate HIPAA, younger docs that are okay with it. That's the kind of problem you face. Not enough money, just assigning it to IT. You know, so the solution is not going to be right or wrong. The solution is going to be you know, kind of better than others, good enough, maybe reasonable and appropriate, et cetera. Right? So here's, when we're talking about risk management, Here's how we simplified it. This is why we, John said it's like, you know, in, in, in software it's like a, almost like a, a recursive loop. It just goes round and round, right? You assess. That's a risk assessment. You simplify. You can't. You, you might you might assess ten thousand risks and you say we can't possibly address these ten thousand risks with the budget and the time we have. We're going to take the top fifty, and we're going to address those this time. 
That's what simplify means. Protect means actually implement the controls, right? The controls are the things that plug vulnerabilities. We're going to talk more about that because that's the whole reason for this webinar is to talk about risk. But protect means implement it, actually do, implement the controls, right? Update the servers, um, put encryption in, whatever you need to do, that's the protect part. Monitor is, once you protect, you've got to figure out, is it working? How do you figure out, is it working? Well, you've got to watch it. You're not watching it. You can't manage what you don't measure. You're not watching it. You don't know if it's working, right? Then you've got to be able to report on it. Report to whom? Well, report to your management to figure out how you're doing. Report to an auditor if somebody comes in and audits you. And then, oh, by the way, what do you do after that? Well, then you reassess, okay? And you keep doing this. It's not set and forget. So we've covered a lot of sort of, you know, upfront stuff, context. Martin, are there any questions at this point? Not at this time. Okay. So it turns out big problems require small solutions, right? You got to get started. And, and, you know, at the end, doing our shameless plug, we'll talk about how Espresso helps you get started with risk assessments and with dealing with risk. So, but get started. You got to do something because otherwise you're in willful neglect and the fines start at $50,000 a pop. $50,000 per violation, okay? Up to a million five for identical violations, but there's no cap. That's a million five cap for similar violations. If you've got 20 different violations, then that's 20 times a million five as your max penalty. Theoretically, there's thousands of violations you could be uh, you know, found um, not compliant with. So there, you know, there's, there's really no cap here. Okay, This is the standard. This is the monster, the standard of security rule, administrative safeguards, 164.308A1, I believe. In your PDF, if you click on this, you're going to be taken to the HIPAA survival guide and you can see the whole source. That's the standard, and then the implementation specifications come in underneath that, and here they are. Risk assessment, risk management, those are the two monsters, and then sanction policy and activity re review, those are not so monstrous, and they're all grouped into this first standard. Okay, so what's a risk? So we're going to use the definition that... NIST use, uses because, you know, we use the NIST model like everybody else, okay? That's the gold standard. That's where we started, and this is their definition. The net mission impact considering the probability that a particular threat, say fire, will exercise or accidentally trigger or intentionally exploit a specific vulnerability. Say you don't have a, your servers in a room that don't have that's not fireproof, right? Don't have that halon or whatever that, that replaced that, okay? And the resulting impact, if this should occur, by this should occur, it means the threat actually exploiting the vulnerability, okay? So that's the definition of risk. And we like to use this model here to say that the first thing that you do when you want to identify risk is you have to identify threat vulnerability pairs, okay? And a risk at the most atomic level is one threat, one vulnerability, and then the P is the probability of that threat exploiting that vulnerability times times the impact, the mission impact to your organization, and that equals risk. Okay? And it turns out that even though this is uh, looks like a mathematical formula, in practice it's really just a heuristic, okay? Because this does not require the impossible, which is to try to do this uh, exercise in some sort of statistic, uh, statistically correct way. Okay, some people have tried that, but everyone that's tried has nearly failed. It's almost an impossible task. So when you cry, when you calculate the probability, this model says it's okay to use a subjective value of high, me high, medium, or low. And when you calculate the impact, business impact to the mission, to the mission of your organization, you can use high, medium, or low. And when you calculate the risk as a function of P times I, you can use high, medium, or low, okay? And everyone we know has used that model, okay? And that's what Espresso uses. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the atomic level of a risk. You're dealing with one threat, one vulnerability, calculating the probability of that threat exploiting the vulnerability, and then uh, gauging the impact to your business. It's going to shut us completely down. It's going to not allow us to deal with these kind of patients. Whatever it's going to do, that threat exploits the vulnerability, and then you have a risk, and you assign a 
level to that risk of high, medium, or low. Okay, Martin, any questions at this point? No, but I was just going to point out that you may have one threat that may have more than one vulnerability. And you, and that's always going to be the case, almost always going to be a case that one threat can exploit multiple vulnerabilities, as we're showing here, and that the same vulnerability can be associated with multiple threats. So you have a many-to-many -many relationship if we're talking about, like, from a database schema perspective, okay? And this, uh, uh, this image is just a cutaway, essentially. You can see uh, a tree forming with, with the three uh, threats, uh, each with three vulnerabilities. And this is an example of how, of how that relationship develops. And then that P times I obviously focuses on one pair of threat and vulnerability. And the relationship between P and I um, it is important to grasp because P, obviously, the probability that the threat will exploit the vulnerability. It doesn't matter how it happens, whether it's, it was an accident done on purpose. The, the fact of the matter is it, it, it's happened now. What's the likelihood of it actually coming to pass? I is, is conceptually distinct because it assumes uh, that the threat exploits the vulnerability. So what's the likelihood of it happening? And assuming it did happen, what's the effect? Uh, we, we do have one question that's come up. Is there a common set of standard threat and vulnerability pairs? Ah, uh, that's a great question. If you look, if you look in the wild, like at I, IBM's X-Force website where they have, they literally have hundreds of thousands of threats. Threat, le threat landscape is so big that you can't really get your mind around it, okay? So now, but what we did with Espresso is uh, we, we took a matter, antimatter. I don't know if that really helps you, but for example, the implementation specifications in the security rule tell you to do stuff. That stuff they tell you to do is really a control. Like, if you don't have a disaster recovery plan, one of the implementation specifications of the security rule is says implement a disaster recovery plan. Why? Because that control plugs that hole that you don't have one. Okay? So that's the that's why we can pre-populate uh, Expresso with threats and vulnerabilities that cover the entirety of the security rule. Because we recognize that implementation specifications were nothing more than controls. Now, is that all the controls in the universe? No. I, there are literally hundreds of thousands, but you're not trying to. You're, you you can't possibly take on the uh, objective of comp, you know fixing all those. It, let's just let's just start with the ones that are identified in the security rule because those are the ones that you're bound to do by law. Other ones you may be bound to do because you really need to do those other things to protect your intellectual property, to protect your PHI, to protect whatever it is that you do, right? But we're concerned with Espresso, and here we're concerned with complying with the security rule. So we've defined a, a set, and we've you know rationalized the problem. I think we came up with John like 160 risks, correct? 100, 150 right now. Yeah, 150. Okay, and so you know we 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 have you know threats like weather, theft, you know the ones that you would think of. So you don't start with this blank sheet of paper, because if you've ever tried to do this with spreadsheets and started really thinking hard about what NIST is asking you to do, you'll definitely be ready for the straitjacket, okay? It's a daunting, daunting problem to try to associate these threats and understand all this, right? You'll be, you'll be pulling your hair out uh, trying to get your mind around how this actually works in practice. It's great you know, uh, as a theoretical concept, as it actually works in practice, it's quite daunting to, to do. Um, yeah, those, those first 150, uh, I mean, that was um, that was a challenge for us uh, for us to put together. You know, it, it takes it takes hours, it takes days, um, and you do need to continually expand on that. And in a um, in our shameless uh, plug in a bit, uh, we'll cover the fact that you can um, expand on that. We've identified 150, but that's just the start. That's your baseline risk assessment that you can run off and do in a few hours and then build on next time. Right, and, it, and, and we, we were starting from a point where, you know, I've been doing this stuff for years now. I was intimately aware of the problem. In fact, 
we used to give you spreadsheets, right? That would help you try to do this with spreadsheets. And you know, it, it, you know, we we knowing the rules, we're pulling our hair out trying to figure out exactly from a practical perspective we would go about doing it. So the problem was totally, totally non-trivial. Uh, uh, and one of the things I wanted to point out before we move on, it's not so clear from this diagram, maybe John, we can do like a follow-up diagram, is that controls are the things that you put in place to plug vulnerabilities. Now we're going to talk more about that, but you also relate them to security objects. And what are security objects? Well, they're bigger than just your hardware, bigger than just your PC your PCs, your servers, your phones, your network routers, all that, they also include your workflows, right? They also include your workforce. They include anything, okay, that touches PHI, maintains it, accesses it. It's much, much bigger than hardware. So you're applying controls essentially to a set of inventory, okay? Exactly. Exactly. We don't use the word inventory because we're trying to capture the fact that it's it's a larger concept than that. But essentially, yes, it includes places, for instance, uh, your server room. room. Yeah, that's a great example. It includes rooms, like your server room, right? So that's you know that's not a physical. Well, it is a physical asset, but it's not like a piece of hardware, right? But that that would be included as a security object because that's something that a control would be attached to. Okay. Um, Okay, so the question I'm asking now is, let's review this, risk defined. The net mission, considering the probability that a particular threat will exercise or accidentally trigger or intentionally exploit a specific vulnerability and the resulting impact, okay? Well, then my question here is, is that a good definition? My conclusion is, no, it's not, Ricky. And the Ricky here is, you know, like Ricky Ricardo. So if you guys don't know who Ricky Ricardo is, that means you're really young. So here's my perspective on risk. Risk is not something that you learn about in a HIPAA compliance management program or an MBA program, okay? You don't understand risk when you are playing with other people's money in case of, you know, your financial manager, okay? That's not really risk. That You don't really have a concept of risk. You you only acquire a gut, visceral understanding of a risk when you personally have some skin in the game. He, for example, your career or family's future is on the line. My point is, HIPAA used to be this little game where you ran around and you did some feel-good training and you put these posters on the wall, and you know what? You didn't do much else, and that was it, you know? And and maybe at a you know bigger organization, Kaiser Permanente, they did some more and they had Somebody had a fancy title called the risk manager and you know, blah, blah, blah. But HIPAA, prior to the High Tech Act, was an unenforced paper tiger. So nobody was going to go to jail. Nobody was going to get fined. Nobody was gonna, nothing was going to happen. Essentially, it was an unenforced paper dot tiger. It was the dirty little joke of the industry. All you had to have was your notice of privacy practices, and that was it. You, you complied, okay? Now, the world has changed. And CEOs, compliance managers, directors on the board, there's real risk out there. Just ask the CEO of Target. Okay, they they whack them because of that, because of because of the breach that they had. Okay, you're not playing with other people's money anymore. You really got to be doing this for real. There's real consequences. And going forward, I think it's my perspective that all knowledge workers are going to turn into risk managers because really you have to permeate risk privacy and security throughout your organization and included in your organization's DNA if you're actually going to have any chance at all of, you know, defeating the bad guys or at least minimizing the pain from the bad guys, okay? That's just simply the nature of global competition, okay? And we're never going back to the good old days. I mean, my perspective is the good old days weren't all that good, but we're not going back. We're only going forward, okay? So what are the components of a risk? We already talked about it, right? Threats, vulnerability, we've used this diagram. Okay, so let's use uh, this metaphor that um, that John came up with. And John, I'll let you talk us through it, and then and I'll just sit, you just tell me when you want to do the next slide. Okay. Um, in this analogy, your organization is like a ship, and, and um, a, uh, a vulnerability would be like a hole in your ship. So it's something that's exploitable by a threat, here being water. So water coming through the hole, the threat exploiting the vulnerability, 
is the risk that you're trying to account for and that you're trying to control. Now, how do you control it? By plugging the hole. And that's why Carlos mentioned earlier that, um, that controls are really the antimatter to a vulnerability's matter. Matter and antimatter cancel each other out. The control uh, addresses the vulnerability. It addresses the risk by plugging the vulnerability. So, um, uh, so, so in, 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 go ahead, John. No, no, go ahead. So, in this particular case, the, the vulnerability is addressed um, by plugging the hole in the ship. You plug the hole, so the controls directly target vulnerabilities. Okay, that's what controls do. You don't have a disaster recovery plan, implement one. Okay, you don't have two-factor authentication implement two-factor authentication, right? You don't have um, whatever, locks on the server door, implement locks on the server door, okay? The controls, and some of the controls are, you know, software, hardware, some of it are just training, right? You have a workforce that's untrained, well, what's the vulnerability? An untrained workforce, well, what's the control? Train them. That's how you plug the vulnerability, okay? And the beautiful thing about that is because uh, threats and vulnerabilities have a many-to-many -many relationship. By addressing the vulnerability, you're also you're in one swoop taking care of the myriad ways that that vulnerability could be exploited. So with two-factor two authentication, uh, that's the vulnerability that's ex that can be exploited in many different ways for someone to gain unauthorized access to your system. But with two-factor authentication, um, all of those possibilities are now not going to happen because you've addressed that. You've implemented two-factor authentication. So you don't so need to worry about those things in the same way that you did before. So let's talk about what two-factor authentication means. OK. Yeah. Uh, two-factor authentication is generally something you know and something you have. So something you know most commonly would be your password. Something you have might be your, your cell phone. So uh, when you log into your bank account, if you have two-factor authentication on your bank account, then in order to log in, you need the password, and they send you a text message to your phone with a code. So you're proving to them that you have this device that they know you've got. So um, when someone tries to compromise your account, they try to get into your account without your authorization, say they uh, they somehow get a get a hold of your password. That's not enough because they don't have your phone. If you lose your phone, someone can't just use that because they don't have your password. It's another obstacle in the bad guy's way, and it's actually a quite effective one. Exactly, and it's not. It's becoming easier and easier to implement, and that's why you see, you know, Bank of America, any, any financial institution, almost all organizations now online are implementing two-factor authentication. Okay, if they they see you logging in from, you know, uh, Columbia, and you usually log in from Tampa, Florida. They're going to say, you know what, we, we don't recognize where you're logging in from. So you need, we need something else to authenticate you, right? And authentication just means you're proving to, to that organization that you are who you say you are. Something you know, something you have. Now, when you when you implement two-factor authentication, you probably eliminate. Uh, or plug, uh, um, you plug with one plug, you probably eliminate hundreds, if not thousands, of threats, right? Because there's there's literally hundreds of thousands, maybe an infinite ways of gaining your password through phishing schemes, through hacking, through whatever, right? And two-factor authentication is the best thing we've come up with to sort of deny the bad guys in. Nah, nope, user ID and password ain't enough. You gotta you gotta have Something you know, something you have. You ain't got the token, you ain't got the phone, you don't have it, we don't let you in. Okay, yeah, it's, important to, Go ahead, yeah. it, it's important to mention here that obviously there's no such thing as 100% secure. The fact that you have two-factor authentication can eliminate a lot of potential pain down the road, but nothing's 100%. So it's, it's another obstacle, and it's a very high one for the bad guys, but nothing is insurmountable. Exactly. In fact, the consensus now is that you have to assume you have to assume that the bad guys are going to penetrate your network, and you got to put in layers and layers of 
security to try to minimize the dwell time. So any, anybody that you speak of in, in, in the IP, in the, in, in the security information security business understands now that the perimeter is essentially, you know, indefensible. You can't defend it. Bad guys will find a way in. All you can do is make it harder for them. And that's what two-factor authentication does. It doesn't completely uh, eliminate the risk, but does it reduce the risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate? Yes, because the industry, as an industry, we haven't found anything better right now than two-factor authentication. Okay, so that's right now as good as it gets. Martin, any questions? Not yet. Okay, you guys are either overwhelmed or this stuff is just too basic for you. So what's the impact to the organization and what controls will plug the vulnerability? Once you've identified the probability of a particular threat exploiting a particular vulnerability, that's what you're asking yourself. What's the impact? What is this going to do to our mission or to our business, right? And then, well, what controls are we going to put in place to plug the vulnerability? So who's on the hook for this stuff? Ultimately, everybody, right? Because you're not going to be successful unless you permeate. If you're the compliance officer, you're the CEO, you permeate privacy and security throughout your organization, okay? It's not a top-down thing that only the compliance officer, only IT or whatever, right? But definitely the compliance officer is going to be on the hook, right? They're going to come calling. If you're not doing your job or you're telling your CEO, no, we're good, we're going to be compliant, and then you get a $4 million fine because, you know, you essentially stuck your head in the sand or you didn't implement basic things or you didn't even raise these things as things that you needed to do, then you're probably going to get whacked. You know, but you probably update your resume and go back to school because, you know, there goes your career as a compliance officer. Now, you know, the fact that your boss may get whacked, that, you know, that's a little consolation for you. Okay? So, compliance officers are definitely on the hook. The executive team is on the hook. The board is on the hook. Okay? There's a lot more cooks in the compliance kitchen now that are on the hook. Now, we've broken down what a risk is. A risk assessment is just a process of identifying lots of risks. Okay? That's that's what a risk assessment is. Um, again, Martin, before we go into our shameless plug here, any questions? Somewhere? No, we don't have any. Uh, I would suggest that people, if they have questions, ask them. We're easy, yeah, please. We're easy to get along with. Ask your question. So Espresso allows you to do risk assessments, okay? Espresso rationalizes this problem that we've been talking about. It's software as a service. It's going to be part of our subscription. We're in uh, heavy test mode right now. We expect to be shipping by August 15th. We expect to have some existing customers already doing beta testing real soon. So, uh, we, we, you know, August 15th is the live ship date that's going to be available to the general public, okay? And it deals with security objects. Security objects, again, is like this inventory. It's what you apply controls to, devices, places, persons, network, processes. It's an inventorying process, but we don't require a complete inventory, or Expresso doesn't require a complete inventory. In fact, you can do a valid risk assessment in, in a matter of hours. The, an, the analysis part with all 150 risks without having any security objects at all, because some controls, like not having a disaster recovery plan, apply to all security objects, okay? And there is no requirement that you have to have a perfect risk assessment. Just that you do a risk assessment that try to identify the risk that the security rule points out, and are you working to implement controls uh, that will plug those vulnerabilities? That's a risk assessment, okay? So that's why we say you can do a risk assessment in a matter of hours with Espresso, not weeks or months, because you don't have to have your entire inventory. Obviously, we allow you to import, you know, some of these things, like, you know, from your human resources, your workforce, or from an a a a a your asset uh, control system. If you put it in a particular CSV format, we will import, import it. So, Espresso deals with threats, vulnerabilities, impacts, all these things that we've been talking about, and then it lets you report on it. And then it lets you see, okay, I have this risk. What controls are associated with this risk? What did I actually implement here? What did I implement in risk assessment one? And what did I implement in risk assessment two? And what did I implement in risk assessment N in, com 
it, it, it contains a complete history of risk assessment. So you could go back in time and say, okay, you know, back in um, 2016, we did a baseline risk assessment with the stuff that Expresso came pre-populated with. And then in 2017, we added more threats and vulnerabilities as we became more accustomed to, to doing risk assessments. Or in the second, first quarter of 2017, we did one. The second quarter of 2017, we did another one. And here's what we fixed. And now you have visible, demonstrable evidence that you're doing risk assessments, and you can use that. Uh, to argue, or your counsel can argue, that you have done something to reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. And of course, as John said, we provide you a starter set, but we allow you to add all the threats, vulnerabilities, risks, controls that you want to uh, populate. We also, uh, when we identify controls, we also, if it's a security rule control, we also tell you where in the security rule the actual language is, and you can click on it and go directly to the HIPAA Survival Guide and read it. Okay. Any questions before we go on? I'm just going to show a few more screens here. Of you know, here we classify security objects by categories and then by classes. Okay, and so a, a category, and John, you can you can speak to this a little bit. A, a category be. Here are the categories. Here's a list of categories: devices, networks, personnel. Okay, and then within devices, this is what this is showing. Within devices, we have classes. Okay, some devices are PCs, some are phones, some are printers. So, John, talk a little bit about how you apply controls, how we apply controls to security objects. Right. We've broken it down into this um, hierarchy of uh, classes and categories as a uh, means of helping our customers rationalize their security object field, which um, even in a small organization is going to be very, very large. Uh, between all of your hardware, all of your people, the places, rooms, every everything that we've talked about and more, uh, even a small organization is going to have probably a few hundred, maybe even uh, approaching a thousand, uh, especially as the organization grows. that. Uh, raises at an exponential rate. So breaking it down into these levels will help uh, keep things clear and it helps with uh, applying controls because we allow you to apply controls individually. Say you were looking at one particular PC, you can apply a control to that. If a control applies to all of your PCs or all of your servers, so that entire class, then you can apply the control to that entire class. And if it's even more uh, approaching global, let's say it applies to an entire category, your entire workforce, your entire set of networking equipment, uh, then you can also apply the control to that. So you don't have to go through and say, all right, we've got, um, we've got 57 phones in, uh, in this building, and we need to go through and click a control 57 times. So with this rationalization strategy, you can save some time on that and keep things in order. Uh, right. Any questions? Any yes, questions? yes, we do have some questions now. Um, is Expresso built to accommodate multiple entities? For example, is it an appropriate tool for a consultant who does multiple risk assessments year, both covered no, entities? No, no, let, me just stop, let me just stop right there. Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. This isn't for this isn't for this isn't like a consultant can buy one and then have all their clients. Okay, if a consultant buys one, it's because they're a BA and they're doing it for themselves. If they want their clients to have one, then their clients have to have an espresso. I just want to make that clear. This is per entity, one per entity. You can't have consult. Obviously, we're not in the business of giving away our software and letting consultants give it away for free and implement it. Right? No, it's not built for that. Right? It, it, it's built per. Um, you got to have one per profit and loss center. That's how we license it, okay? And for consultants, attorneys, blah, 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 yeah, you can buy one for educational purposes, but you can't use it for, for your clients. For more than one client? No, for <laughs> not even one client. Oh. You can use it. You, your client has to buy it, not you, the law firm, or you, the consultant. If you buy it, you're buying it for your own purposes because you're a BA or because you want to study it, I guess. Okay. If you determine a 
risks, ultimate risk level is, say, a medium, would it be expected that actions be taken to reduce it to low, or can an organization justify a risk as medium and okay because they cannot afford the steps to get it to low status? Well, absolutely, because that's what the security rule says. That's what that's what gets back to the the, the that's what gets back to. This is not a mathematical formula. It's, it gets back to the the weasel words of reasonable and appropriate. Okay, is it reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, resources, talent, etc., to leave this at a status of medium? Okay, it's a purely subjective exercise. Okay, and that's the nature of the beast. Is that that's not going to change anytime soon. So you you can make that call, and actually you you have to make that that call uh, because there it's it's too much to address all at once. Especially if you're doing your first risk assessment or your first iteration of risk management, yeah, it's bound to happen. You're going to have some uh, you're going to have some risks that that you'd like to address, but you can't either because of time, resources, what have you. Yeah. Moreover, you're probably going to have some highs that you can't address. Okay. Yeah. And you know you got to make that call. You just got to make the call. The fact that you're doing it, the fact that you have a process in place, that's what gets you out of wolf on the left land. Okay? Remember, there is no perfection here. And, and don't let that this concept of perfection stop you from doing common sense things. Yeah, yeah. if you have 5,000 risks that are identified as high, you might not get them all. In fact, you know, you might identify the 160. Uh, now, when we identify the risk, we don't go through we identify the risk, the threat vulnerability pair. We don't go through and assign the probabilities. That's your job. That we can't possibly know what the impact is going to be to your organization. We can't possibly know in your organization is the probability of this threat you know, impacting this vulnerability high, medium, or low. But we identify them. We pair them together. And then you just have to go through and click and say, no, in our organization, that's a high or in a medium. In our, our organization, that impact, if that happens, no, it's going to be high. All right, and then you give a then you give a a probability to the risk. That that's how it works. Ransomware risk is a tech problem initiated by a user opening an email, which is an administrative issue. Training don't open weird emails. In the end, it may be a financial decision if no backups exist. I don't understand. Is that a statement or a question? And ransomware. Ransomware generally, the hypothetical, the way ransomware works is the bad guys come in and they encrypt your PHI. So now you can't get to it because they got the encryption keys. And even if you had your stuff encrypted, which means there may not be a breach, that's a that's a, 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 a area of controversy right now, okay? Say your stuff is fully encrypted, data at rest. Well, the bad guys, they don't know, you know, they don't have you, generally they wouldn't have your encryption keys, okay? But they encrypt your encryption. So you still got a problem. You still got a security rule violation because your 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 the integrity of your PHI and the availability of your PHI has been compromised. You may not have a breach, however, but generally it's bad guys coming in and saying, "We got your data. Now pay us money." All right. Now what are you going to do? Every 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 hospital that I know of has paid the ransom because what are you going to do? Have your patients start dying? And in, in the case in Melbourne, obviously it doesn't apply. To, a, to Australia, but in the case of Melbourne, a hospital, the bad guys not only encrypted it, they started changing patient data. So now you got patient B taking patient disease medications. You're going to kill people. So what are you going to do? Not use your data or wait three, you know, two days? Hopefully you can bring your backup on another server. Maybe most organizations have been paying the ransomware through Bitcoin. It's the smart guys have gotten really smart about what's traceable and what's not. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the email, the phishing. That's it's a very it's a very common method of uh, of ransomware propagation. It's not the only method, uh, but absolutely um, unrecognized emails. I mean, it's it's kind of a one on one thing. But it's but it's hard to integrate that into your organization's DNA. You know, think even that one thing. That's hard to get your entire organization to do. So and that's just one aspect. So this is a, definitely a, a non-trivial problem. And it's something that you need to have a robust plan for. 
in our webinar uh, in our webinar on ransomware, we discussed um, uh, some proactive measures that you can take in addition to reactive measures. And there, there needs to be that whole host of what are you going to do, and you won't be able to figure out what you're going to do unless you take that analysis step. So that's a part of the risk assessment. And there's a uh, uh, comment here. Ransomware is now report a reportable event according to a to the HHS. Well, it's not really. Yeah, the HHS just issued some guidance that has caused some controversy because because and I think it caused some confusion. It's there's a presumption of a breach, okay? But it, but there can't be a breach. And I'm just going to go here on my soapbox. And if you want to get in on the conversation. You can go to the HIPAA Survivor Guide LinkedIn group, and you can get you can get the opposite opinion, or John can give you the opposite opinion. But there's now a presumption of a breach, which means it's reportable under the breach notification rule, right? But look, by the breach notifications rule on, own analytical framework, if there's no violation of the privacy rule, if the privacy rule has not been compromised, in other words, if the bad guy, if you had your stuff all encrypted, then they didn't see any PHI. So therefore, by definition, there hasn't been a violation of the privacy rule. Therefore, by definition, uh, you don't have to you don't have to uh, report. I mean, that's that's the entire safe harbor of that's the entire safe harbor for the breach notification rule. If you encrypt as to the NIST standards, then you don't have to report. Okay. Now HHS, you know, because they got nothing better to do than confuse the freaking marketplace, they come and say. Well, ransomware is a reportable event. Oh, nice, nice. They should have said ransomware is a reportable event only to the extent that the privacy rule has been uh, compromised and there's no exceptions and there's a low probability, blah, blah, blah. Essentially, you know, it, it's a reportable event if it, if it would be a reportable event under the breach notification rules analysis. But instead of that, instead of that, in their infinite wisdom, they don't say that. And so they cause all this confusion. Okay? And HIPAA's got enough stuff to be confused about. So that's my take on that. I don't really have a strong opinion otherwise. No, I didn't. I didn't <laughs> think so. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the good thing about presumptions, though. It's presumed to be a breach, but presumptions can be defeated. They are defeated all the time. Um, I mean, in, in law, we, we uh, the, our law firm predominantly practices intellectual property. So with a copyright registration, you're pres it's presumed to be valid, but it's just a presumption. It can be challenged, it can be defeated. So it doesn't mean that 100% this is, this is a breach and we're just going to treat it as a breach because we said so. Um, here's another question. I'm not sure what what we're looking for integrity of data if encrypted by other uh, I'm wondering if they're talking about the ransomware encrypting yeah, you know, your the encryption the integrity is probably the most difficult thing to get your head around the security rule because integrity really means did somebody come in and change your data okay by definition if you encrypted your data all your data at rest. Let's just say that as a hypothetical. Then they can't really change your data because they'd have to break the they'd have to break the encryption to change the data. But in the case of Melbourne, they not only they not only encrypted the data, but it wasn't encrypted to begin with. So they started changing, and now they violated the integrity of the data because the data no longer is what you thought it was. Patient Z is now taking patient B's medications or at least that's what the electronic health record says. That's a violation of the integrity of the data. Did somebody come in behind the scenes and change it in a way that was un unauthorized? And it doesn't need to be nefarious. Yeah, if is that correct? It, uh, right. It could yeah, be no, no, right. You could do, well, you could do it. You could do it. I mean, I, you could do it innocently, right? I mean, a, a program, a bug, right? A bug. In, in, in your EHR system could start changing records it shouldn't change and now the integrity of the data has been compromised. We don't have any more questions at this point, gentlemen. Okay, so you guys get a feel for what we do with uh, Expresso. The way it works is uh, it's a 24, 
ninety-five, $2,500 a year for the first year. You get the subscription, but you not only get Espresso, you get the, our other 30 products. You get all our training products. You get our security rule checklist, our privacy rule checklist, our breach notification framework. You get all of that for $24.95, and you renew at $12.95 a year, okay? Because, obviously, you know, Espresso is a software as a service, uh, and as long as you keep renewing, you keep having access to your risk assessments. And we like to think that we provide the recipe and not just the ingredients. Our, mi our mission from day one has been to teach the industry more and more about HIPAA, the reality of HIPAA, clarify some of the myths, clarify some of the bogus stuff that gets put out there. Uh, and so we, we, we take that as our, our mission. We provide educational products you can start executing on day one. That's because we have an agile methodology mindset, right? So just get started solving something, and you'll learn from that. You'll grow from that. And you'll get better at solving. So we have agile compliance products. They're agnostic as to whether you're a business associate or a covered entity. It's wetware. It's teaching you how to do something, okay? Uh, because software without wetware is really just an empty container, right? It's the how-to stuff that is really valuable. So except no substitutes, we think in, 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 in with Espresso, with our complete suite, we have a unique offering uh, in the marketplace. And Martin, if there's no further questions. There, there are a couple. Okay. There are a couple. Uh, you referenced one of the HIPAA standards, 164.308. Before ending, would you give a reference for the full HIPAA Act, including privacy and security breach? I'm, I'm not sure what the I'm not, I'm not sure what the question is. Um, HIPAA Act. You you can go out to the HIPAA Survival Guide website and and see all the regulations. If you know, let me think because I know this is not going to work because it never works when you when you want it to, right? On 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 a demo. But let me let me just try. All right. If this is what the so you go to the HIPAA Survival Guide, right? And you can watch this introductory video that we're going to. X out of, and hopefully everybody can still see my screen, Martin? Yes. Okay, then you click on HIPAA regulations, so this is the middle column. It's HIPAAsurvivalguide.com. This is the middle column, HIPAA regulations. Okay, the part that you want to get to is 164, CFR 45 part 164, security and privacy. You click on that, and you're going to get the privacy rule. First, first of all, you're going to get some definitions general provisions, and then you're going to get the security rule, subpart C, okay? This is administrative safeguards, 164.308, and, and then you have the physical safeguards, and then you have, and if you click on one of these, you'll be taken to the definition of, like for example, you want to go see the standard for security management process, you can click on security management, and here's the standard, and here are the four implementation specifications that, um, that you need to implement. And within Espresso, we also allow you to click on the controls, tying them back to the security rule, and you can come here and get, get to the full source. Obviously, you can go, if you prefer, you can go search through all the government's PDFs uh, that, have, that have the regulations. But one of the things that we do is we maintain an updated copy of all the regulations because our educational products point to them, right? And we don't want to be pointing to stuff that's outdated, right? So well, our part of our mission is to keep all this stuff updated, right? And that's why we get 30,000 visitors a month because people know we maintain it. We get visitors from the office of the White House. Our biggest user, believe it or not, is HHS. Health and Human Services comes to our website when they want to look at what the latest stuff is. So I hope, I, I believe maybe that's what the, the audience member was asking. Well, certainly if it wasn't, it does point her to, her to, to everything that, that's out there. There is another question. Well, we be and we got to just got to thank you. So we will we be getting a recording of this session. Uh, generally, we make recordings only available to our subscribers. We have, um, you know, we, I mean, we've been doing this for years. So that's part of one of the subscription benefits is you get. Uh, but lately, we've been making some exceptions, and we we may make. Uh, these recordings available for a short period of time. So if you see an announcement, first of all, you should be subscribed to our newsletter. All right, that's how we announce everything. And if if we make this generally available to the public, 
a recording will limit it to like three or four days and the way you'll get notified is that uh, through the newsletter or through an email from constant contact not necessarily no, but yeah, but yeah. yeah but we're only going to be able to reach you if you're subscribed to the newsletter that is Otherwise, correct. Know, we don't we don't know about your existence and that's all we have Great. Well, uh, John, thank you for uh, helping me out today. It's been uh, our pleasure being with you guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone, for taking the time. Thank you, and have a good day.